The Beatles were the chosen ones to launch the counterculture, most directly through Paul McCartney's bohemian avant-garde circles in London, centered on the Indica bookstore of his girlfriend's brother. Carefully cultivated, deftly engineered, and promoted sparing no expense, the Beatles counterculture exploded worldwide featuring occult magician Aleister Crowley amongst other Luciferian acolytes on an album cover in 1967. Crowley had died 20 years ago today when Sgt. Peppers taught the band to play in 1947. Prophet Bob tells the shell-shocked children of the assassination that the Beatles are coming, they're going to hold your hand in his song Murder Most Foul. The latter part, of course, the title of their first number one single in the U.S. officially released three weeks to the day after the assassination, again emphasizing the number three. Although receiving airtime on American radio as soon as one week after the assassination. Dylan tells us to slide down the banister, go get your coat, ferry across the mercy, and go for the throat. An exceptionally rich passage. Most superficially, it references Jerry and the Pacemakers' 1964 British hit, Ferry Across the Mercy. What is most significant about it is it is one of a multitude of references to 1964 in Murder Most Foul. It is the year the Beatles came to America, a pivotal year that commenced exactly 40 days after the assassination, a mockery of the many 40s in the Bible, including the 40 years in the wilderness and most prominently the 40 days and 40 nights of deluge that eliminated the fallen and their Nephilim children whose disembodied spirits became the demons. This is also related to the 40-week human gestation period and the spiritual code God placed into our very bodies. 1964 also saw the much-heralded Mary Poppins, winner of that year's Best Picture Award. In spite of a British accent so horrible that bad accents became known as Dick Van Dyking it, it also featured prominent banister sliding, like that mentioned in this passage of Dylan's song. Mary Poppins is a witchcraft pharmacia symbol, her umbrella standing for the syringe, which shoots things into our bloodstream to alter our genetics. The song in Mary Poppins, A Spoonful of Sugar Helps the Medicine Go Down, was written by Robert Sherman, whose son came home from school telling him they had given him an inoculation for polio in a sugar cube. The Bannister and Fairy references in this line of Dylan's is about two of the associated JFK conspiracy figures in New Orleans, Guy Bannister and David Ferry. Both deserve a video of or two solely about them. Guy Bannister, former Chicago FBI special agent in charge and fired New Orleans police chief, had his private investigator's office at the same address on Lee Harvey Oswald's hands-off Cuba flyers. Like a number of apparently unassociated JFK assassination figures, he played a noteworthy role in the first wave of flying saucer phenomenon in 1947. But by the way, in 1982, a nephew of Carlos Marcello showed me a stack of these hands-off Cuba flyers uh, in a building that was under construction uh, being renovated to become a timeshare uh, at the foot of Canal Street. David Ferry was a mafia CIA pilot, the two organizations being unified in the New Orleans of my youth and maybe everywhere. He had alopecia rendering him hairless, which he bizarrely compensated for with grease paint eyebrows and patches of red mohair carpet glued to his head. He lived in a building owned by Dr. Mary Sherman, in which he kept hundreds of mice for cancer research. Dr. Sherman was my dad's doctor and close personal friend, 
and she herself was mysteriously killed, most likely in a secret MK Ultra bioweapons lab run by Dr. Alton Ochsner, which also employed Oswald. Ferry was arrested the day after the assassination on suspicion by DA Jim Garrison and was about to become a star witness in Garrison's 1967 JFK assassination investigation when he became another strange death in the case. It is worth noting that alopecia may symbolize a shearing of the sheep shaved head separation from God ritual and that the syringe so potentially crucial to the fallen from mingling their seed with ours was named for Syrinx, a nymph of Artemis. The rapist god Pan pursued Syrinx known for her chastity. Pan wished to corrupt her. To hide, she was transformed into a stand of reeds. Pan cut the reeds down to fashion the famous pipes of Pan. Hollow reeds were the basis of the syringe by which the fallen self-styled gods seek to inject corrupting agents directly into the human bloodstream. Remember, God's word tells us the life is in the blood. Dylan's line, go for the throat in murder most foul, refers to the first shot, that first shot demonstrably afflicting the fully conscious president, <coughs> pardon me, as his hands instantaneously clutch at the bullet wound, obliterating what is the fifth chakra of expression in their beliefs of the youthful president they allow to express hope and idealism of a better world, one without the Cold War, racial segregation, and extremes of poverty. But that is a secular or social gospel dream easily shot down. Fallen humanity will not make a better world. Only Messiah shall do that. From here, Dylan proceeds to direct mention of the three tramps arrested in Dealey Plaza, for whom there is no arrest record, nor even of the arresting officer. The metaphysical trajectory of their perp walk led directly into the Woodstock and Aquarian age of the hippie counterculture, which hit the wall at the ill-fated Altamont Rolling Stones concert, disfigured for all posterity, with Mick Jagger pleading sympathy for the devil and the angels of hell committing murder in front of the stage near which the Dylan persona announces his intention to go and sit, as if in reverent contemplation at an unholy shrine in sight of blood sacrifice. This theme of blood sacrifice may be surreptitiously ensconced in D Dylan's next line. Put your head out the window, let the good times roll. Which seems innocent enough on its surface. However, just following imagery at the end of the counterculture, it seems in keeping with the Gnostic Ouroboros mentality to juxtapose the end with its proto-beginning, the beat generation. One of several bloodletting anointings of this crucial socio-spiritual phenomenon was the decapitation death of the first group wild man and predecessor of the doomed and damned Neil Cassidy, one Bill Canastra. One day, Canastra was pulling another batshit crazy stunt for attention, hanging out the subway window at the Astor Pat Place stop, according to Allen Ginsberg. Astor, as in Waldorf Astoria, creators of America's first slum in the Pentagram Five Points neighborhood, which breach birthed the gang culture on the blood-stained hardwood killing floors of New York's first slaughterhouse grounds. Canastro was a well-connected Harvard Law graduate who didn't practice law, but gained renown throughout Manhattan circles by hosting endless bacchanals for artists like Tennessee Williams and Jackson Pollock popular among the rich and famous. <coughs> Astor as all, is also the name of the early science fiction writing family member who went down with the Titanic. Astor as in Astarte Ishtar, five and six point star sigil magic symbols. Canastra met his end on Aleister Crowley's birthday, October the 12th, 1950. The third, number three again, birthday in hell, for the man who called himself 666.
Canastra had been the boyhood friend, the boyfriend rather, of Joan Haverty, who became the mother of Jack Kerouac's only child, a daughter, whose one legacy for her from her deadbeat dad, too arrested in development to man up to his responsibility, was a disposition for extreme alcoholism, dying young and ravaged. So the role in Dylan's Let the Good Times Roll may have several different meanings. Most immediately, the early rock and roll hit by Shirley and Lee from New Orleans, where much of the JFK assassination plot took place. <coughs> and secondly, the role poor Bill Canastra's head took when it departed his shoulders. And lastly, to the famous teletype role upon which Jack Kerouac banged out a draft of the cultural tsunami novel On the Road, supposedly in three days. The first draft being done on tracing paper discovered in the apartment Bill Canastra and Joan Haverty shared by Kerouac shortly after poor Bill lost his head by being an ass in Dionysian oblivion to which way was up. The devil's devilish rites and celebrations of this song, Murder Most Foul, which thus far have included the assassination, the counterculture, and various human sacrifices, now announces more deviltry in a party going on behind the grassy knoll, just preceding the song's Masonic 33rd line, stack up the bricks and pour the cement. This line may also obliquely refer to Donald Trump, who stacked up the bricks and built the wall. Trump made a fortune in New York real estate construction, a thoroughly impossible accomplishment without doors being opened into the dark corridors where real power lurks in the shadows. New York real estate is famously managed, along with unions and the cement business by the underworld, who popularized cement shoes, uh, as in the East River swimming attire for those that cross them. Also, it may uh, reference the constructing the site for the upcoming Metonic uh, cycle ritual in September 2001 in New York, stacking up bricks, pouring cement. Murder Most Foul starts off by implying that the Kennedy assassination was in part payment for debts he owed the mafia. Most famously, the alleged stealing of the 1960 presidency in Chicago by Sam Giancana's Al Capone legacy crime family. Although many of the parties involved may themselves have believed this election stealing was for real, they are actually the marks and suckers in another level of the game. The real fix is in way in advance. The truly rich and powerful are, are adverse to gambling. They do not take risk or leave things to chance. Obsessed with power, <coughs> obsessed with power, they and their operatives are up early and up late covering every single base to maintain it and expand it. Stealing elections is done purposely. In this case, perhaps to piss off the mafia in 1960 to make them more pliable in the King Kill 33 ritual or in the year 2000 to gauge how lame the electorate is, as in the languid response when the election was stolen for George W. Bush, with the full knowledge and cooperation of Al Gore, whose daughter, by the way, married into the Schiff banking family, an apex predator banking family bloodline. The 33rd degree of Freemasonry is alluded to later in the song with Zapruder's film, I've seen that before, seen it 33 times, maybe more. It's violent to see, it's cruel and it's mean, ugliest thing that you've ever seen. Abe Zapruder was allegedly a 33rd degree Mason, which might explain why he stood there filming while everybody else ran for their ass like normal folk at the crackling of gunfire. It might also explain the vile deceit of Dan Rather's lie when allowed to privately view this film by Time Life magazine, who had scooped it up and locked it away from the public immediately, the cryogenic freezing of the truth that precedes the revelation of the method years later. Ritual magic mind control operation. 
Rather's private viewing description was directly contrary to the reality depicted in the Zapruder film and validating the lone nut gunman from behind thesis promoted at that time, brought to light when sowing confusion and fear became the order of the day. Murder Most Foul repeats the theme of three, which mentions the triple underpass, the Trinity River, which is a double mention of three or 33. Immediately thereafter is the line, black face singer, white face clown. Better not show your face after the sun goes down. I was rather amazed at Dylan's connecting black face and white face, as has been done on this channel's Ragtime Revolution segments in our Song and Dance of Black and White series. They are both masked for the demonic and intimately related in casting spells. One spell is that of white supremacy, demonstrated in the dozens of so-called sundowner towns, sporting signs at their city limits, ominously threatening, God help you, N-word, if the sun ever sets on you here. Ironically, white supremacy was fostered by the exact same power elite that has put forth BLM. <coughs> the other meaning besides the spell of black and white racialism is a reference to the night breed of fallen angels and demons symbolized by pale blood-sucking vampires, brain-eating zombies, and beastly lycanthropes. Next, Dylan tells us, I'm in the red light district like a cop on the beat. There are several meanings here, but what jumps out at me is the juxtaposing of red as in the red light district and blue as in the traditional cop uniform. This is a reference to the blue blood descendants of the fallen angels wishing to mix their seed with the red blood of Adam and Eve's descendants. Not to mention, this blue blood is copper-based and cops got their name from the copper shields they used to carry. For a protection, <coughs> excuse me, for protection during civil violence. This metaphor also reflects the red and blue civil war holding pen the sacrificial cattle have been herded into. The red light district in Dallas is Deep Elm, historically a black district originally called Deep Elm after the street upon which JFK would be killed. This is what Dylan means by the real nightmare on Elm Street. 2551 Elm, which not surprisingly is numerologically number 13, 2 plus 5 plus 5 plus 1 equals 13, in, in 1916 became the temple for the secret society Knights of Pythias the first secret society chartered by an act of Congress and whose membership rules both several American presidents and other dignitaries, including Nelson Rockefeller. The building was designed by a member of Booker T. Washington's family who faithfully played his part for the boule management of black America on behalf of the GTO power elite. And there are other motives mentioned in this song by Dylan. The Invisible Man is a symbol for the stealth of the perpetrators of the assassination and is the second monster movie character mentioned to star Claude Rains, whatever that might mean. Just after The Invisible Man is Goodbye Charlie, another 1964 movie about <clears throat> a male shot by a jealous husband who comes back as Debbie Reynolds and has the mob gunning for him, her, in addition to being released in, the in 1964, just following the assassination, this is the second possible reference to transgenderism in the song, reflecting our contemporary non-binary times. The first was Bill Canastra, with whom Joan Haverty, the mother of Jan Kerouac, would go peeping into windows of strangers while she was dressed as a sailor. Co-star Tony Curtis in Goodbye Charlie had previously gone famously transgendered uh, with Marilyn Monroe and Jack Lemmon in the movie Some Like It Hot. Dylan sings, they killed him once, they killed him twice like a human sacrifice. The day they killed him, someone said to me, son, the age of the Antichrist has just only begun. Air Force One coming in through the gate, Johnson sworn in at 238. Let me know when you decide to throw in the towel. It is what it is, and it's murder, most foul.
Well, that's real revelation of the method. They assassinated him as a sacrifice in King Kill 33 to work magic upon our minds. Then they assassinated his character by airing his dirty laundry, further eroding our optimism, so strongly identified with the young president. It was the inauguration of the Antichrist age. They built us up and they took the wind out of our sails. The last time an image of vigor and idealism would command the nation. We would become aware of our imprisonment by the enemy, but lose sight of our redemption in Messiah. LBJ takes the oath as president one minute after 237, a number coded in TV and movies over and over again as a number of the beast standing for our rib cage with sets of two, three, and seven rib pairs. The rib cage representing the cage the beast forges for us, like the Ouroboros of endless cycles, endless repetitions, never getting anywhere, never ascending to the kingdom of God, so we give up. Decide to throw in the towel because it is what it is. The conspirators tell us. A couple of lines later, Dylan affirms that the assassination has torn the soul of the nation away and we're slipping into slow decay and that it's 36 hours past judgment day. 36 is called the triangular number. If you add up all the numbers in sequence, one through 36, one plus two plus three, etc., they add up to 666. The next verse has Wolfman Jack speaking in tongues. The late disc jockey of American graffiti and midnight special fame is the beast man possessed, shaping young minds and siren songs with siren songs sent out over the prince of the power of the airwaves, promoting materialism, glossiness, narcissism, hypersexuality, and all of the counterchrist virtues. Later on, Dylan mentions a pink horse ridden down a lonesome road to watch the King Kill 33 sacrifice's head explode. A pink horse is a bizarre oddity until you consider <coughs> that it may be a symbolic admixture of the white and the red horse of the apocalypse, the first two horses John mentions in his revelation. The white horse rider is conquest and carries a bow called a toxon, sports a crown, and brings disease and pestilence. Our recent worldwide pestilence was named with the Spanish word for a crown. This may have been <clears throat> a foreshadowing of what is to come, a test run of the impending full spectrum dominant surveillance state. We were told where we could go and if we, and if we could work and what we had to put in our bodies and what we could say and not say, we submitted and we were conquered. Like most dictatorships, it enjoyed the backing or tacit acceptance by most of the population. Card 19 in the tarot deck is the sun, the symbol of Apollo. We see the crowned and conquering child astride a white horse. This card's number suggests the 19-year metonic cycles mentioned earlier. The second horse, the red horse, is civil war, war, and conflict. We see this in our no common ground red-blue politics erupting into violence in the Antifa BLM-led violence and killing in the George Floyd murder aftermath. And on January numero seis, uh, Trump tards following agents provocateurs like lemmings over a cliff. Later on, in more exhortations to play songs, Thelonious Monk and Charlie Parker are mentioned. Tellingly, Thelonious Monk was the lover of Nika Rothschild, and it was in her house that Charlie Parker died. The major arts and entertainment movements since the 19th century are seldom far from the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, or some other blue blood sponsorship. Inevitably, the money trail for almost all we hear in media and through education 
leads to the marble steps of palaces. Whether it's the Bolsheviks or the Beat Generation, it takes big money and well-developed networks to succeed, even in so-called rebellion. He next rolls out mentions of heroin, silent movie comedians, Hollywood biopics of private of Broadway dancers and solitary convicts, gamblers, and underworld celebrities. All of it afflicted on an unsuspecting humanity by their own leaders in a Matthew 4 world where the kingdoms are still in the hands of Satan. Thus, in the very next line, the unseen record spinner is exhorted to play Cry Me a River for the Lord of the Gods. The song made famous in the 1956 The Girl Can't Help It, starring Jane Mansfield, who, like Sammy Davis Jr., was openly a member of Anton LaVey's Church of Satan. It's Lord of the Gods, gods with a small g, those angels in rebellion who became deities to those nations divorced from God at the Tower of Babel, the false gods and unclean spirits like those invoked by witches uh, Lindsay Buckingham and Stevie Nicks, mentioned in the next line of Murder Most Foul. <clears throat> by the way, in 1986, uh, Stevie Nicks threw a drink in my face at a party in New Orleans after I Riley remarked to her as she was speaking very derogatorily about the people who were working the party, saying, uh, I said, you're a nasty drunken little bitch, aren't you? And I didn't realize she was so sensitive about her diminutive stature. We could go on and on about this song, but for time's sake, we're going to cut it right here and do a part three at some time as yet undetermined future date. This is Gumbo Craig, and this is Walking Out of Babylon. All glory to Yahuwah, the most high God. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. I picked up my first cold in four years, so I've been stifling a cough through this, and sometimes not so well. With the new year, we're going to start by doing installments, one of the first of probably several installments on a very important book by Timothy Alberino, Birthright, The Coming Post-Human Apocalypse and the Usurpation of Adam's Dominion on Planet Earth. So we will see you then in 2023, just that much closer to the return of Messiah. Again, this is Gumbo Craig. Good evening.